Right. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to read from the introduction to begin this uh, um, reading. And uh, yeah, it, is my on James? It's, it's on. It's on? All right. Okay. My first formal encounter with poetry happened through my mother, who, looking at the lilies that bloomed in a garden each spring, quoted from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire. But it could very well have been through the renditions of Ghazal that my, of Mirza Ghalib that my father played so often. I cannot recall which came first, but the magical presence of poetry during my formative years had, had got, caused a wound. This wound opened itself again once in my teenage years when I first read a poem by Aga Shahidali. I vividly remember reading poems like A Rehearsal for Loss, Stationery and his famous one-liners, Suicide Note and On Hearing a Lover Not Seen for 20 Years Has Attempted Suicide, a poem whose title is longer than the body and marveling at the sheer simplicity and clarity. There was something ineffable about his language that instantly took a hold of me. Years later, I was informed by his brother, Iqbal, that Shahid had singled out some poems, short poems like stationery as crowd pleasers that he would open his reading with to charm the audience. The trick had worked on me, and over the next few years, the more I read, the more Shahid reeled me in. I could also say, at the risk of romanticizing the past, that I became aware of Shahid at just the right moment, when I was ready for him. The years leading up to my first novel were also the years of my political coming of age. Throughout my bachelor's degree, I was working on a novel set in Srinagar in the early 90s. Although I read numerous accounts of writers and journalists, I fell back naturally on, on Shahid's collection, The Country Without a Post Office, only to realize that no one was a match for him. Eventually, I ended up using Shahid's, uh, a couplet from Shahid's Ghazal of Light as the epigraph to a section of my novel. Although the political subject matter of the collection was important, it was the aesthetic sensibility reflected in his language that make, made it remarkable. Much later, I read in an interview that Shahid always placed the aesthetic value over the subject matter of his poems. For three years leading up to the publication of the book, I'd used Shahid's works as a lens through which I saw and understood Kashmir. In time, however, the lens itself, itself became the object, which I started looking at from a fresh set of eyes. I suspect one of the reasons I fell in love with Shahid was because his poem, poems mapped all the languages, cultures, and worlds that I believed I belonged to. Shahid was completely South Asian and completely cosmopolitan at the same time, and in his poems, I could sense the pro presence of both Ghalib and Eliot, of the West as well as the subcontinent. But as I delved into his work, I discovered that there were more layers than I could have ever imagined. Shahid was a beneficiary of three cultures, Hindu, Muslim, and Western, and at his home, poetry was recited in four languages, English, Urdu, Persian, and Kashmiri. Although he wrote in English, his poems, in essence, captured the sensibilities of all these languages and traditions. His father, Aga Ashraf Ali, was an educationist with socialist inclinations and introduced him to the ideas of Gandhi, Nehru, Buber, while his mother, Sufia Aga, a Sunni Muslim from Uttar Pradesh, sang bhajans to him and dressed him as Krishna for Janamashtami. While on one hand, his, grand, his grandmother, being Zafar, Zafar Ali, was a devout Shia Muslim who taught him about Islam. On the other hand, he went to a Catholic school and throughout his formative years was fascinated by Christ. I soon realized that Shahid was the sum total of these different cultures and learned from all of them, that he never viewed them as contradictions, but simply as different worldviews that later coalesced in his poetry. In his poems, there is not only, only the presence of these cultures and traditions, but also several allusions to the works of other writers and poets. Much like Eliot had done in some of his poems, Shahid weaved into his work the works of other poets, such as Mandelstam, Fez Ahmed Fez, Emily Dickinson, John Milton, Rena Mar Maria Rilke, Paul Celan, Yanis Ritzos, Octavio Paz, and C.P. Kavafi, who for me at the time were not his precursors, but poets who flowed through him. It was almost as if his poems had doors which one could open and enter a different world altogether. They should be devouring poetry all the time, and some of the pleasure is in recognizing, Shahid had once said. He was indeed a poet whose works existed, whose works is, uh, sorry, wait. In, he was indeed a poet in whose works is, existed a universe, and in time, the influence of all the poets I discovered through Shahid's poets Poetry shaped my understanding of history, geography, and languages in numerous ways. At the time, as I read these poets, my admiration for Shahid grew, and I realized that these poems were on the same pedestal as other poets, and I came to respect him 
even more for he was, from my point of view, the centripetal force that bound all of them together for me. In the summer of 2016, I moved to New Delhi for my master's degree in English, and it was the city Shahid was born in, where he spent seven years of his life from 1968 to 75. In Delhi, I saw his poetry everywhere, in streets that light up with the smiles of beggars. At Jama Masjid, I witnessed how minarets ca camouflaged the sunset, how prayers rose brick by brick. Although I could trace Shahid's poems in Delhi and Srinagar, when I started looking for the poet, there wasn't much, barring a few articles and reputes by its friends and students, some papers on the internet, and the introduction to the Whale Suite by his friend and poet da Daniel Hall. Now that I look back, I believe it was the summer of 16 that I first thought about writing Shahid's biography. I traveled various cities from Srinagar to Lucknow and Goa to meet Shahid's friends and family. After interviewing more than 40 people and taking more than a dozen flights, I finally decided that only the only place to left to Scarborough was the Aga Shahid Ali archives at Hamilton College in Clinton, New York. However, there was a strange turn of events. I was denied a visa by the American embassy. Those were the years of the Trump administration whose signature issue was the immigration policy. In time, I eventually received almost all the documents that I required, one of which was funnily enough an essay by Shahid titled Dismantling Some Silences, published in the 1989 spring issue of Poetry East, in which he criticized the United States immigration policy and asked questions that his father would present rhetorically at dinner parties in Mansi in the 60s. Would America give Christ a visa if he were to appear by chance, his rope torn and his hair covered with dust before a US council in Damascus or Khartoum or Baghdad? Christ, after all, my father continued, believed in just distribution of wealth. He had divided the fish and loaves equally and had kicked the money lenders out of God's house, radical by many American, by many American standards. Ahuzia guests look uncomfortable, the question had altered their us usual discourse of self-congratulation about the land of the free. They had to admit to themselves that Christ would have been denied a visa, perhaps <laughs> to the embarrassment of the nations of the world, which might, which, which then might have convened a special session of the Geneva uh, of the General Assembly, em Assembly in Geneva. Reading his letters, the drafts of his poem, and the interviews, I realized that even though Shahid was constantly negotiating his identity, he had made it clear that for him, language was the only homeland. First and foremost, I consider myself a poet in the English language, he once said in an interview. But with that came another, perhaps a more important realization, that Shahid was unlike any other contemporary poet I had come across. At a time when there are so many attempts to dissolve the person and the poet, Shahid emerges as an exception. He had decided to become a poet at the age of nine, and throughout his life, he worked towards achieving that goal. He was riveted by his poetic pursuits that, that he ended up turning it into a manifestation of his art, However, what made Shahid truly special was that he was always aware of this dis distinction between the personal life and the poetic pursuits. Though he was, and though his personal life overlapped with the poetic persona, it was in a way that I had never encountered before. Shahid was indeed what Eliot called a mature poet, one whose life wasn't more interesting, but was, as opposed to an immature poet, a, a more finely perfected medium in which special or very varied feelings are at liberty to enter new combinations whose personal emotions or the emotions provoked by an eventful life didn't make him interesting, but his impersonality, which he achieved by surrendering himself, wholly did. Shahid was always on the lookout for a phrase or a line that he could turn into a poem, and so much of his poetry came to him, as with the mystics of Kashmir and Sufi saints from dreams and visions. The writer Amitabh Ghosh, his friend, believed that in his determination to not just be a writer of poetry, but an embodiment of his poetic vision, he was, I think, more of an heir of Rumi and Kabir than Eliot and James Merrill. Shahid drew a distinction between his poetry and personal life, and yet he put all of himself into his art. That is what made his poetry so different, where the more one reads his poem, the more he really tru the, the more he truly truly reveals himself to the reader. Darling, I don't want immort immortality through my works, Shahid once said, quoting Woody Allen to his friend and publisher, Rukun Advani. I want immortality by not dying. <laughs> Although his works have attained immortality in both in the Indian subcontinent and the West, uh, this biography is my attempt to keep Shahid or at least his memory alive. And that's a bit more, but I think I should stop there. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Manan. Um, so I should I should introduce you. Can I introduce yeah. you now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just just um so so um Manon um is doing a PhD at Harvard, and you know, you get all sorts of incredible applications to do PhDs at Harvard, but not usually from people who already have a book coming out from <laughs> the University <laughs> Press, a book that's already been published in India. Um 
and um, Man is just such a great um, reader of, of Aga Shahid Ali. And, and, and it's and one of the questions I wanted to ask you actually was about the nature of the, the uh, book you've written, because it's sort of part biography, but it's part, but it's also, and this is what really excites someone like me, I guess, full of these wonderfully intricate and yet at the same time very readable analyses of these individual poems so so from the start was was that how you felt you needed to do it um i did it was i think it was, i was all and thank you so much for the <laughs> is, uh, yeah but i think i was um always aware that like the reason that i wanted to write about shahid was because um at the age of 16 17 when i when i when i when i really started reading shahid's poetry it was um one of those moments where I realized that there's so much hidden in his poems that you need mm. to, it's almost like a puzzle. You need to unearth like so many things. You had to read so many other poets to sort of make yeah. sense of his work uh, to a degree. Mm. Um, and for me, it was the poetry that mattered the most. But when I went out to like um, uh, read more about his poems, his poetry, there wasn't a lot. Yeah. Mm. And so I started my research and turns out like um, it turned into a book where it was almost like... I mean, of course, it was a biography, but then it was primary. Uh, it primarily focused on his works and how yeah. his life interacted with his works. Because I was really curious as to how his personal life, his private life, interacted with his uh, poetry, and uh, that seemed to me like one of the most interesting things about Shahid and the way he sort of like negotiated between his private life and what made it to the poetry, what how it, how it informed poetry and how it worked the other way around. Absolutely, and if the aesthetic yeah. was if the dimension of things was so important for him, then you know, it totally makes sense that the book should you know, foreground the poetry itself. I think just when you were saying that about um, how the aesthetics were so sort of paramount, it sort of reminded me of another poet who, on the one hand, is all about style, but also very, very attentive to history and injustice. And that's Auden. Hmm. You know, like the story about Auden um, when he was younger, uh, just sort of, you know, reading a poem out to Isherwood, Isherwood would say, these are the best lines. And he just remove all the other lines. <laughs> they just put it together. Yeah. So that creates the, the effect of what's going on in the poem, which hmm. Auden often had early on. And it's that, but also the kind of trust that making that aesthetic venture hmm. will afford you some genuine purchase on you know, the most horrifying yeah. historical realities. Right. I think that to me is what's so yeah. exciting about yeah. Aga Shahid Ali's poetry and something you eliminate me as well. Yeah, I think it's, it's I think it was just like, just his attention to language mm. and just like the way he sort of was always on the lookout for poetry. Um, I mean, I, I remember speaking to someone who called it uh, the magpie method. Mm. Um, I think some of his poems come from like, a, 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 a telephone conversation that someone else was having, like I think a poem called Farewell, where uh, he repeats this lines, line, line, it, it turns each time it re appears in the poem. It, it's something like, Your history gets in the way of my memory, which was someone, uh, someone said this to uh, uh, their partner on the phone, yeah. and he picked that up and turned it into like this line about like um, Kashmir and yeah. uh, the exodus of the Kashmiri pandit, pandits there. and I think he's sort of this poet was always look, on the lookout for like certain lines, certain phrases, and um, which he would eventually incorporate into his poetry. And um, yeah, and I think you mentioned like uh, how the poem was cut down, uh, the 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 Auden poem you were talking about, and I think it did, did so much of that, like um, looking at the drafts and how like each poem evolved and how he sort of worked around with that. Yeah. yeah. That was, Do you think we should yeah. read one of his poems? Like, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I was just going to say about the book. Um, which is fantastic. I highly recommend it. There are moments that if they were filmed for a biopic, it wouldn't. It would be too implausible. There are <laughs> moments where uh, we know exactly when a certain uh, line or rhyme arrived from because it was mm. said at a dinner table or mm. said over coffee in the morning. Um, it's. I mean, it's. I guess a, just another example of how life and work mm. for him were just so enmeshed yeah. um, that I don't know. We can kind of like pluck the exact moment <laughs> if something happened. Yeah. Um, Do you want yeah. to begin with the poem? Maybe I could yeah. read some. I, there's yeah. some late poems I was thinking of reading. Do we want to start with anything early or? Um, um, Whatever you'd like. You want to read the cousin, right? Yeah, I should, yeah, yeah I'd love to. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I, I guess I'm just curious. Has anyone encountered uh, Aga Shahid Ali's work before? We have some nods, some shakes of the head. Um, the first of his poems that I really learned about and loved were some of his last poems, um, poems written in a form called The Guzzle. Um, I'll call him Ali. You could just yeah. call him Shahid because yeah. you guys are friends. But Ali does have this hilarious quote in something about how 
he hates it when Americans say guzzle because they always say it wrong. And now I'm, yeah. Just, yeah. I'm just committing this <laughs> sin into the microphone. Um, it's a form, and we, I guess we can talk about the context and history of the form later, but I, I think I'll just read a note on the form as um, Ali presents it in his, his book of guzzles. It's, if you were to think of like the great success stories in forms and poetry, I think this is one of them. He, it went from being a form that very few Americans wrote, and now it's one of the most popular yeah. forms in poetry, and we can maybe talk about how it's spread. Um, so I'll read the note on the guzzle. It'll sound very technical, and then as soon as I read a few, you'll know exactly how it works, I think. Um, so this is from his book, Call Me Ishmael Tonight, posthumously released. Um, the guzzle can be traced back to 7th century Arabia. In its canonical Persian or Farsi form, arrived at in the 11th century, it is composed of autonomous or semi-autonomous couplets that are united by a strict scheme of rhyme, refrain, and line length. The opening couplet sets up the scheme by having it in both lines, and then the scheme occurs only in the second line of every succeeding couplet. Um, the first line, same length of every succeeding couplet, sets up a suspense, and the second line, the same length, but with the rhyme and refrain, the rhyme immediately preceding the refrain, refrain delivers on that suspense by amplifying, dramatizing, imploding, exploding. So what does that all sound like from that di dictionary definition? I'll, this is the quick example he gives on the first page of the book, just one couplet to kind of teach you how it sounds. This is a poem called I Have Loved. I must go back briefly to a place I have loved to tell you those you will efface I have loved. So in this example, I have loved is the refrain and the rhyme that comes right before it is place or a face. Um, the poem, if you've read, if you're up on contemporary poetry, it's taken on this amazing life in the work of black American poets. And I think it it has lots of, I don't know, affiliations with, with the rhyming and refrains we're used to in blues and hip hop and different um, elusive and associative forms. But Ali can do it really like no one else. So I'll read this one. This one's called Of It All. Um, he referred to these forms in an anthology as ravishing disunities. Every two lines will seem to jump to a different world, a different scene, a different cultural context. It might even seem like different people are speaking in each couplet. And yet there will be such sonic um, connective tissue connecting them all that it doesn't seem to me as, I don't know, dissociative or mind exploding as, as certain avant-garde poets. Mm -hmm. And yet it is doing very similar things. So this is of it all. I say this after all is the trick of it all. When suddenly you say Arabic of it all. After algebra, there was geometry and then calculus, but I'd already failed the arithmetic of it all. White men across the US love their wives curries. I say, oh no, to the turmeric of it all. Suicide represents a privileged moment. Then what keeps you and me from being sick of it all? The telephones work, but I'm still cut off from you. We star in America, fast epic of it all. What shapes galaxies and keeps them from flying apart? There's that missing mass, the black magic of it all. What makes yours the rarest edition is just this. It's bound in human skin, final fabric of it all. I'm smashed, fine enemy, in your isolate mirror. Why the diamond display then, in public, of it all? Before the palaver ends, hear the sparrow's songs, the quick, 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 oh, the quick of it all. For the suicidally beautiful, autumn now starts. Their father's heroes, boys gallop, kick off it all. The sudden storm swept its ice across the great plains. How did you find me then in the thick of it all? Across the world, one aches for New York, but to long for New York in New York's most tragic of it all. <laughs> for Shahid too, the night went quickly as it came. After that, old friend, came the music of it all. So unity in sound, but kaleidoscopic range in sense. Um, yeah, and so much all, elusiveness. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So is that Elliot for Quick Quick the Sparrows? I think yeah. so, yeah, the Sparrows song. And there's a bit of James White after that. We were just talking about James White. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the poem of uh, football player. Yeah, the football player. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there's 
this couple that made both of you two laugh. Mm -hmm. um, there's a famous Basho, um, is it haiku about um, being in Kyoto, longing for Kyoto? Yeah. Oh, and oh, yeah. um, Agashir Ali turns out to, to being in New York, longing for New York. Oh, yeah, um, I miss that. He's a, such an elusive poet, and yet, I mean, I think something about the fluency, the virtuosity with these rhymes mm -hmm. and refrains, it just makes it seem like he's not alluding at all. It, it just had to, mm -hmm. he had to come up with a syllable perfect phrase in that way. Yeah, and I think like in, in the Urdu Ghazal, at least, like there is like this illusion that works constantly, mm -hmm. uh, is at play constantly throughout the um, Urdu Ghazals where a poet will refer to uh, the precursor's work and extend a metaphor. Mm -hmm. But to do that in the English language would mean referring poets who came before you, who you would read before. And sure. so this is one of those things. And I think in tonight and other guys like this, I think this is a guys where he refers to Eliot's Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that keeps happening throughout all of this collection. Yeah. 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 Even the title, I think, is a reference to both uh, Moby Dick, but also the story of Ishmael from Kula. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the book is called Call Me Ishmael Tonight, which is that once it's the most American introductions, call me yeah. Ishmael, the story of Moby Dick. Yeah. Yeah. And yet for this uh, Muslim Kashmiri poet, it also brings to mind the story of, of Ishmael, mm -hmm. um, the patriarchal yeah. figure. Yeah. Um, there's lots of terms that I guess we throw around to talk about poets like Ali. They're transnational, they're hybrid, they're syncretic. Um, and I don't know, those work from a distance. Then you read the poems and it's just so complex how different worlds mm -hmm. collide in yeah. each phrase. Yeah. Um, yeah. I could read another. There's one other yeah. Ghazal I really love. So um, the person who got me into Ali's work um, is a fantastic poet named Daniel Hall, uh, who wrote the introduction to this volume. Um, and he was very dear friends with Ali. And Ali had a way sort of, of thanking and repaying his friends by, by weaving their lines into these Ghazals. Um, so he'll dedicate the poems to the poet. And he'll do this, I think a great favor for a poet to do, which is he'll give them the last line. <laughs> um, he'll set them up like for the perfect slam dunk or the alley-oop um, and he'll let the other yes, poet. Like, yeah, 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 thank you. <laughs> I, think I am an American. Um, uh, so I was gonna read a poem um, dedicated to Daniel Hall um, called In Real Time. And I'll, I'll read the Daniel Hall's line so you can prepare your ears for it, I suppose. Um, so it comes from a poem called Mango Spines, uh, where the speaker of Hall's poem says, um, and he's referring to a Henry James novel. Um, I'd also been reading the spoils of Poynton, so slowly the plot seemed to unfold in real time. And I suppose if we're trying to reconstruct how Aga Shahid Ali struck on his own poem, he maybe his magpie ear picked yeah. up um, a plot unfolding in real time, and he thought, that's just too good. I need to... I need to use it, but I'll save it for the very end. So this guzzle is is simply called guzzle or in real time. Um, it has this epigraph from James Merrill, another favorite poet. Feel the patient's heart pounding, oh please, this once. Um, and I don't know, it's it's hard to say what these poems are about. I think it's a poem about it being in real time. I don't know if I could be more specific than that. Um, and maybe we don't need to be more specific, but here goes. I'll do what I must if I'm bold in real time. A refugee, I'll be paroled in real time. Cool evidence clawed off like shirts of hellfire, a former existence untold in real time. The one you would choose, were you led then by him? What longing, O oh Yar, is controlled in real time? Each syllable sucked under waves of our earth. The funeral love comes to hold in real time. They left him alive so that he could be lonely. The God of small things is not consoled in real time. Please, afterwards, empty my pockets of keys. It's hell in the city of gold in real time. God's angels again are for Satan forlorn. Salvation was brought, but sin sold in real time. And who is the terrorist? Who the victim? We'll know if the country is pulled in real time. Behind a door marked danger are being unwound the prayers my friend had inscrolled in real time. The throat of the rear view and sliding down it, the street of farewells now unrolled in real time. I heard the incessant dissolving of silk. 
I felt my heart growing so old in real time. Her heart must be ash where her body lies burned. What hope lets your hands rake the cold in real time? Now, friend, the beloved has stolen your words. Read slowly. The plot will unfold in real time. And then only after that, for Daniel Hall, the friend whose words were stolen. Yeah, yeah what I really like about this ghazal is that uh, towards the end of the ghazal, in the final couplet, the poet has to inscribe the name. Um, it's called yeah. Takullus. Mm -hmm. But he uses beloved instead of using his name, which um, Shahid means beloved in Persian and a witness in Arabic, mm -hmm. which is another like um, ghazal which he ends with. Um, and I think he's really clever, but um, there's something to be said about his formalism. And, and I think you were talking about his like the beauty, the, the unapologetic beauty of his poetry, which is yeah, something I find really um, well. Well, he, I, I guess it it goes against the idea that if you're writing on poetry of witness, and if you're writing about atrocity, that the poem must be aesthetically punitive or, or rebarbative. Um, because um, that kind of anxiety about aestheticizing things just doesn't seem really to exist in his poetics. And mm. as such, it kind of profoundly challenges a lot of the assumptions that, that we might have in sort of Anglo-American poetry or however you, you might want to put it. So I think I might read um, a, a poem beginning with... Um, an allusion, if that's the right phrase, to Wallace Stevens and the snowman. And um, at first, I couldn't place these lines at all, and it reminded me of something. And, and I noticed that analyses of this poem, which is called I See Kashmir from New Delhi at Midnight and is about the horrific state of affairs in Kashmir at the time, still has this opening two lines which are quite oblique and they're very beautiful and I didn't couldn't pinpoint it until Chris pointed out yeah it's 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 Wallace Stevens um and then bits of pieces of that Wallace Stevens poem come out later too but the thing is it's not the way we would expect say a poet like Ali to quote a poet like like Wallace Stevens it's not like subversive counter appropriation of the canonical poet to talk about injustice in the global south for instance nor is it a kind of taking um stevens at face value and using him to confer dignity on people it, it's something that is different to both those things mm -hmm. and and i just wondered what language we actually have for talking about this um so it's called i see kashmir from new delhi at midnight it also has an epigraph from yates um uh, from Easter 1916, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, a terrible beauty is born. And so the, the idea, the word beauty and the idea of beauty is important. One must wear jeweled ice in dry plains to will the distant mountains to glass. The city from where no news can come is now so visible in its curfewed night that the worst is precise from zero bridge, a shadow chased by searchlights is running away to find its body. On the edge of the cantonment, where Gupkar Road ends, it shrinks almost into nothing, is nothing, by interrogation gates, so it can slip unseen into the cells. Drippings from a suspended burning tire are falling on the back of a prisoner, the naked boy screaming. I know nothing. The shadow slips out, beckons, console me, and somehow there, across 500 miles, I'm sheened in moonlight, in emptied Srinagar, but without any assurance for him. On residency road, by Mir Pan House, unheard we speak. I know those words by heart. You once said them by chance. In autumn, when the wind blows sheer ice, the shinar leaves fall in clusters, one by one, otherwise. This one, it's you. This one, it's you, I cry out, as he steps closer, the sleeves of his firin torn. Each night put Kashmir in your dreams, he says, then touches me, his hands crusted with snow, whispers, I have been cold a long, long time. Don't tell my father I have died, he says, 
and I follow him through blood on the road and hundreds of pairs of shoes the mourners left behind as they ran from the funeral, victims of the firing. From windows we hear grieving mothers and snow begins to fall on us like ash, black on edges of flames. It cannot extinguish the neighborhoods, the homes set ablaze by midnight soldiers. Kashmir is burning. By that dazzling light, we see men removing statues from temples. We beg them, who will protect us if you leave? They don't answer, they just disappear on the road to the plains, clutching the gods. I won't tell your father you have died, Rizwan, but where has your shadow fallen, like cloth on the tomb of which saint, or the body of which unburied boy in the mountains, bullet torn like you, his blood sheer rubies on Himalayan snow? I've tied a knot with green thread at Shah Hamdan, to be untied only when the atrocities are stunned by your jeweled return, but no news escapes the curfew, nothing of your shadow, and I'm back 500 miles, taking off my ice, the mountains granite again as I see men coming from those abodes of snow with gods asleep like children in their arms. So there's so, so many things about that part, abodes of snow in the Sanskrit, that's what Himalaya uh, means. Um, but there's so many things like that throughout the poem. But, but I was sort of reading that and a contrast came to me. Like I thought of um, Heaney, right? So Heaney writes the um, Stranded Love Bag and he writes about his relative, the, the sectarian murder of this relative. And then he writes another poem where the relative comes back from the dead in Station Island and challenges him and says, you whitewashed my death, you aestheticized it, you drew oh, the lovely yeah. curtains of the purgatory, you did all this stuff. And so that whole idea of what is not allowed to describe blood as rubies, you know, what is not allowed to aestheticize, and, and, and the fact that um, that's just not active as anxiety mm -hmm. in, in this poetry at all, and and I think that to me is one of the really challenging in a good way things. I don't mean euphemistically challenging. I think that you know it shows alternatives to things. Mm -hmm. I I don't really know what it means. Like, is it a kind of a beauty is kind of inevitable in a way? So maybe it's sort of bad faith mm -hmm. to think you could mm -hmm. get away from it, or you could something like that. I don't know if that's yeah, a coherent I mean, it was, question. It was, it was, it was, no, I mean it's uh, because I remember like in one of the interview someone asked asked him i think um about the aesthetics and like the, the formal beauty of his poetry and i think one of the reasons um in the country without without a post office which was this collection which uh released and it was published in 1997 it's been influential for like writers and poets like across like the, over the last two decades um um and one of the reasons i feel is because of its formal beauty and yeah. the different the various forms that he uses um there's a castle the the collection ends with the canzone which is uh, just wonderful um villanelle uh pantuma this and that like so he's not afraid to use these forms and i think mm -hmm. in an interview he mentions that that i would never risk um um the the the, beauty, the, the formal aesthetic like the aesthetic of my poem i would never sacrifice that for the politics yeah and i think that that's something that partially comes from meryl uh maybe maybe it like to a degree it's um uh, meryl's influence on ali but it's also that um, sort of like dedication and like loyalty to language and like first and foremost, like being a poet that it's almost sort of unapologetic. Uh, it's what was yeah. the male comment that he said, you know, you can't help the people in Bosnia, Bosnia but, you but you can write a good poem, poem about, about it. it. Yeah. 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 Um, there's also, yeah. I'm not going to get the, the line as perfectly as, as you have it, but there's some interview where, where Ali seems to say in his poems about Kashmir that he, it's it's a region that has not had its beauty represented in poetry, mm. um, and it seems that a poem like this wants to to show beauty mm. in Kashmir, and it doesn't want to do it in this nostalgic, never to be recovered way. Yeah, it's going to find it even in these scenes of turmoil yeah, and violence. Yeah. 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 But it is such a contrast. I mean, not only from Heaney, yeah. but of any poems you would write today about if you if you were to write a poem about a war torn scene, at least the prevailing style, it would have to be as kind of gritty and. And yeah, asymmetrical. And, yeah. But but in a way, it's like anything can be aesthetically recuperated, can't mm -hmm. it? Like anything, like a gritty aesthetic, can equally be aesthetically recuperated. And aesthetic pleasure is kind of hard to get away from mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah I just think he's very he you know, seems sort of two steps ahead like just sort of quite playful quite sort of mischievous it, it feels like to those of us all tangled up in how do you write about trauma how do you do mm. these things like he all he seems like it's just not a problem for me. He's found some way around. It. It's just yeah. brilliantly sidestepped this thing, which for better or worse, where a lot of us are currently sort of engrossed in, but it's not the centre of yeah. or, or worrying about. Yeah, yeah no, I, and, and that that reminds me of something like a conversation I had with one of the people who knew him, uh, a, a Kashmiri artist, Masood Hussain, who in the late nineties, during the peak of the militancy in Kashmir, um, asked him if he could like provide like a few couplets that he could paint, hmm. and he thought that. Ali, a poet who had written uh, a, a collection like The Country Without a Post Office would give him like something that's really political, yeah. except he gets these seven couplets, which are about the beauty of Kashmir. Yeah. And he's just confused at the time that what's going on, except like I think he sort of like talks about it in a way where um, I think he refers to a Mandelstam poem, We Shall Meet Again in Petersburg, mm-hmm. and talks about a promise which holds its own breaking. And yeah. so he sort of equates that with these um, couplets that he wrote for them, which Eventually, Masood Hussain painted, and I think one of a few uh, are here. In, but uh, yeah, I mean that yeah, connection with Mandelstam is not one I would have made before reading your book. But I can see again, you no know, poet in that case really living through some terrible yeah, events, yeah. and you know, that shaped his own life. Um, but still, with the sense of this responsibility to the aesthetic, right. like the sort of, yeah. and and really, you know, that's very important. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's true for other collections as well. I mean, I, I was just, uh, last night, I was, uh, a day before, I was reading uh, A Nostalgist Map of America, mm-hmm. yeah. which is one of the few collections where he doesn't use the word, word Kashmir. Um, mm-hmm. um, and he talks about the penitentes and the and the crucifixion that takes place there. And that poem is just beautiful. And mm-hmm. I think I might read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the context of this poem is just that... Uh, so in New Mexico, there's a tribe um, where uh, every Easter they reenact um, the crucifixion and a boy is chosen, a bachelor, um, um, for the re- reenactment. And in the process, like if he if he, if he dies, um, his shoes are returned to the uh, to his parents, but his uh, grave is, isn't revealed for a year. Um, and Shahid was driving through New Mexico when he saw this and uh, uh, eventually he ended up writing a poem about it, which was which appeared in his collection, A Nostalgist Map of America. Um, it's called Crucifixion. Among the peni- And the epigraph is, um, Among the penitentes in New Mexico, just before Easter, there is a flurry of marriages. You who are driving clear of memory, north from La Cruces and far from yourself, and farther past dunes of white as gypsum, past the rock that once sprouted wings and bore the besieged Navajos to safety, Past the timbered forest, the penitentes haunt, nomads of the Sangra de Cristos who crucify each Easter one of their own. Though no, as you're climbing higher alone, so terribly alone, and the blue pines are like men descending from summits, that a virgin bachelor has been chosen, that as the road whitens in the moonlight, a cross is being built in a secret hut. And as braided ropes of yucca fibers are soaked in streams, You don't know that silence, answered by its own echo from every direction, is at that moment turning all history to flesh, so that you will be filled again with sorrow, and a god suddenly more mortal than any man will return to his sanctuary to find just life, with no escapes, his idol smashed, the bones of his last worshippers on earth scattered everywhere, no one left to hear his secret weeping. And when memory in the grief of broken stone is nothing but flesh, you will, he- you will hear silence as it was once answered by someone running, a god escaping, his skin the color of sky so that his sweat, wherever he caught his breath, seeped into underground caves and hardened into turquoise. And as you leave the hills, washed now neither of memory nor pain, the gods will have already happened. And you know, and you will know it is too late, always too late, for whose world is not in ruins, whose, that he won't be saved, that bachelor, lashed with ropes soaked in water, blood running down his back, and through the timbered forest he carries the cross, and you, much farther from yourself, will know his sandals have been left outside his parents' door, and his grave in a secret cave of turquoise, 
will not be revealed for a year. And you, driving faster now, will know that a son won't be returning, never coming home. And when far behind you the dawn is blood, the sky a final altar, you will see the trees once again as men ascending the hills. There's one sentence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just one last sentence. It's a sentence. virtuosic sentence. Yeah. He likes that. I mean, it maybe has that. It maybe yeah. has to do with his sense that just things aren't, nothing in his world is sectioned off or, or, mm, or right. bordered in some place. Yeah. That, that beauty and violence are yeah. continuous. Yeah. East yeah. and West are continuous. Yeah. yeah. Um, I find that often, like in a lot of poems, like uh, there aren't like any. I mean, the, the most that will happen, like, is, is that there's an M dash, or, or there are like parenthetical mm -hmm. lines, but the absence, like, of a period, like, a pause where yeah. you can, like, stop and breathe. Because well, it's, well, it's, that it's, felt it's like still... it genuinely was one sentence. Like, well, yeah. yeah. happens yeah. Hold on, wait, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, I guess gems, I mean, they're, they're in a lot of the poems, they're created by, by extraordinary pressures, mm -hmm. aren't they? I mean, yeah. I guess that's something you can say about gems as gems. well as they're beautiful and they're yeah. valuable and they're yeah. precious. Yeah. But yeah, this is one of those poems where I was again uh, reminded of because this entire collect almost the entire collection like recounts his experience of driving from um, um, Arizona to Massachusetts where he taught uh, in UMass, um, and again he's witnessing and he talks about yeah. the Bisbee deportation in one of his poems yeah. and so that element of uh, witnessing and I think it was Derek Walcott who once asked him uh, what his name means Shahid. And that's when he responded to him that it means um, the beloved in Persian and witness in Arabic. And that beloved, like being the beloved and uh, the act of witnessing was central to his poetry. So they often like play and are at play in his poems. And um, the beloved often turns into the witness and the witness will often turn into the beloved and it just moves around like that. Yeah, yeah so that's one of those things where I, which happens a lot in his cousins, I feel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But were there any, any other poems that you want to talk about? This? You said you wanted to talk about the comic oh. Ali as well? I mean, yeah, I guess yeah. <laughs> you were talking about how he, he finds beauty um, in surprising places. And he also seems to make jokes. I mean, it's, <laughs> in the book, he'll make jokes at the worst moments. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a lot of music that runs through the book, um, kind of a, both American and, and Indian music's kind of intertwined. And one of the last songs that kind of keeps on coming up in the book is, this is as Agashir Ali is dying of cancer. He keeps singing to himself, that's the way I like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they kind of would sing it to himself in the in the halls yeah. of the NYU hospital um, to, I don't know, buoy his spirits. Yeah. Um, there are, I mean, there are a few poems that are, that really are literal poetic one-liners. Um, I don't know if I have any of them at hand. Um, here, I'll try to find one. Do you have, oh, you have yeah, one I think so. I think it'll be here. Oh, well, here's one I found. <laughs> um, again, this is a good example of something people maybe won't joke about in the same way today. Um, but I don't know. He's grandfathered in, I think. On hearing a lover not seen for 20 years has attempted suicide. I suspect it was over me. <laughs> again i think you mentioned yeah. there's a poem whose title is far longer than longer this. than the it almost yeah. works i mean title poem works like i don't know set up yeah, in a poem yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, and th this is like where i think uh ws mervin comes in and his influence comes mm -hmm, in yeah uh, because i think mervin has this brilliant like one line which is quite similar it, it's called elegy oh yeah and the yeah. entire poem is who would i show it to yeah, that's just it's just like I love that. So yeah, this poem is yeah. like the the rewriting. Of yeah, it. show it to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you have a favorite? Oh yeah, it's, it's definitely it's um uh, it's from a collection called A Walk Through the Yellow Pages, which is again a reference to uh, Merrill's uh, collection, The Yellow Pages, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think in one of the uh, readings, he talks about how this poem came and uh, how he, how he ended up writing this poem. So. He just moved to the U.S. in 1976, and um, he came came across all these advertisements. Um, uh, and Bell Telephone used to be like what 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 AT and is now. Bell, it was Bell Telephone uh, before 94, I think. And um, there are all these advertisements around, and something like, "It's getting late. Do your friends know where you are? Um, mm -hmm. Today, mm -hmm. talk is cheap. Call somebody." Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, I think he decided at some point that he will respond to them. Um, so I'm just going to read from this poem, The Bell Telephone Hours. It, it has five parts. I'm going to read three, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, so three. And the title of the poem is, of course, the advertisement and then its response. Uh, 
It's getting late. Do your friends know where you are? They know my debts are unpaid. They won't look for me. But if they call, say I'm at the phone booth talking long distance to the dead. This is the longest distance I've called and the bill is running up. Before I run out of change, I must report. The cremations aren't working. Someone's left the bones of their hooks. Operator, I'm still getting busy signals. Reach out and touch someone far away. Use your phone for all it's worth. Once I plugged into the sleep of friends and interrupted their dreams, I spent years apologizing. Once I let the phone ring till the dead woke up. They told me they were sick of the earth. They told me to dial the sea. Underground line locating service. Get me the sea with, when there's no ice. When the water is pure, absolutely free. I've lost faith in half rates. Today, talk is cheap, call somebody. I called information desk heaven and asked, when is doom doomsday? I was put on hold. <laughs> Throughout the hallelujahs of seraphs, I heard the idle gossip of angels, their wings beating rumors of revolts in heaven. Then I heard flames, wings burning, and then only hallelujahs. I prayed, angel of love, please pick up the phone. But it was the angel of death. I said, tell me, tell me, when is doomsday? He answered, God is busy. He never answers the living. He has no answers for the dead. Don't ever call again, collect. <laughs> yeah it's i wonder if uh this is naughty but i wonder <laughs> if there's a bit of influence from this on another south asian american poet writer now chiku reddy mm, and just think on underworld lit yeah, and the right. phone calls and you know, it's really funny in the right. same way yeah. yeah um and it's a similar of those things uh, it's yeah. uh yeah it's a very sort of subtle thing but right. but yeah that's a yeah. sense of humor mm -hmm. that, 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 that comes in yeah and, sense of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say a sense of humor that often is aimed right at the things that are most serious and, yeah. and, and have such piety yeah. for. Yeah. Um, there's a very sweet moment uh, early on in the biography um, about how when the young um, Ali was, heard about other religions, he would ask his parents for a new statue of that religion, almost the <laughs> way you, you would ask for like a Furby or a Beanie Baby. This is like a <laughs> generational thing. So he learns about Christ and he asks for a, a Christ toy, more or less. Yeah. He learns about yeah. Krishna and he wants a little Krishna. Krishna. Yeah. And I guess there's one way to look at that as him being someone who's who's extremely tolerant and trying to synthesize different mm, yeah. traditions. But maybe another way to look at it is he's someone who kind of can, can also lose them too. He can make fun of them. Yeah. He can yeah. miniaturize his Christ. Yeah. Um, the first poem he ever writes, I thought this was so sweet and funny, is a poem about Christ, and it's called The Man. <laughs> <laughs> um, which, like, in itself is like a one-liner of the title. Yeah. I'm just sort of wondering, like, I mean, this is an amazing conversation, but I could talk to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder if people might want to yeah, ask yeah. questions yeah. about his you know, like book, and uh, <laughs> anyone yeah. does want to do that. Um, I'm so I don't know uh, his work at all, mm. but I'm intrigued because um, I'm interested in formalism, and I saw that he was described as like part of new formalism, and I I don't know if that's mm. if you would characterize him that way. It feels like that mm. term is kind of loaded mm. now, almost like politically. Um, but like how. Do you see him as like reviving form or like mm -hmm. choosing specifically to write in form as it's increasingly like mm -hmm. out of favor? Yeah, no, I, 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 th thanks for the question. This is something I was, I was, I, I, I've been working on for about like six, seven months now. This entire like move towards, um, but I think in Ali's case, it was a bit different. Uh, I think, um, uh, okay, this is going to get a bit technical, but, um, Ira Sadaf has an essay about the new formalism um, and, and the poets there, and she talks about how, um, you know, poets poets like um, uh, maybe maybe a James Merrill or a Marilyn Hacker, when they use form, uh, it's not just for the sake of writing in form. That's that's not the point. It's it, it's that th their vision for the poem aligns with that form. And there's if there's repetition in the poem, um, it works in a certain way. Um, we were just talking about Bishop and the repetition in one art mm -hmm. and the way she uses the villanelle to like repeat uh, things. Her mother's watch comes back as, sorry, the the hour badly spent comes yeah. back as her mother's watch and there's yeah. some sort of like internal repetition that goes on. But Ali's work, I feel like 
whichever form he uses, whether it's uh, a canzone, and he, he wrote three canzones, which, are, which I think is the most that any poet's ever written, mm -hmm. I think, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Um, but... Do we know this form? It's, I mean, most people never write one. He wrote three. three yeah. yeah, I think Dante wrote one. He said, that's more than enough. Okay, but, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And um, he writes that, I think, uh, the three uh, canzones he writes is, uh, one is for Kashmir, the second is for his mother after her death. And the third canzone he wrote was, um, well, he actually recited it in a very Miltonesque way. Uh, he'd lost his vision. He couldn't read or write at that point, but he recites this 65 line poem with a very strict rhyme and meter. Um, and so all of these three, uh, um, I think, poems like come for come at a time when he could go on endlessly. For instance, like in, in, uh, I can compare it to maybe Ginsberg's Kaddish, where he just like goes on and on, but the poem allows him to like sort of, it's a constraint which allows him to like sort of deepen the poem with every repetition with rhymes. So I think with a poet like Ali and maybe a Merrill or a Bishop, like when they use a form, there's always like a clear idea of what's going to happen and mm -hmm. why they're using a form. So that vision sort of aligns with that. And, and what was and, that I'm sure, conversation like, you, know, you had you know, about saving oneself from Western civilization? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think in one of his essays, he, 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 he wrote this thing where he says, um, if, if one writes in free verse to uh, save oneself from the... I'm trying to remember. remember yeah, what is save, it? A, save oneself from the um, Western civilization. Poets write in free verse to subvert Western civilization. Shouldn't we also yeah. write in forms to save, to save ourselves, ourselves from... Yeah, save ourselves from Western, Western civilization. civilization. Yeah. 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 Because is it like, um, you know, these poets thinking that... Um, you know, to write in a sonnet, a, a sonnet or something seemed kind of tedious, and there was this sort of cultural coding of, you know, mm. political and stylistic conservatism. But then to write a guzzle was really, really exciting yeah. because it's like, yeah. you know, foreignness and stuff like that. But then he gets quite impatient because all these parts don't know how to write guzzles properly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. One curious thing about about Ali and form is I think we're used to a certain story about 20th century poets where you start formal, you start buttoned up. And then you, whether you're Robert Lowell in Life Studies or Adrian Rich, as she breaks into free verse, you kind of shake off your Harvard education <laughs> and you finally um, express the the free, um, unaccented yeah. self you always wanted to be. And with Ali, it's kind of the reverse. I mean, yeah. the free verse poems in the book go here to the front. And then he he's already published several books by the time he's, he's teaching himself how to write in rhyme and meter and yeah. kind of dip in and out of his different styles. Yeah. I, it's hard for me to think of other poets who, who I don't know reverse the usual story in that way. And some of those famous poems are classic. Yeah, poems. they're great. Like <laughs> Dr. Gorse the Dr. Is, is yeah. a seriously major poem, so he could write really well. Because mm -hmm. it moves like I mean, in case of like, like you mentioned Arjun Rich, and she was one of the reasons that he starts writing cousins in English because okay. uh, she was one who well she moved toward free towards free verse, but she also wrote a lot of cousins in English, mm -hmm. so which were free verse cousins, and so that experimentation leads him back to. Uh, the form and like sort of yeah in a way reinvigorating the form and like sort of trying to like um, bring in like the intricacies of what the form does and so yeah. that's something that's really um yeah I do love Ali but I do think he came up with one of the the snottiest subtitles for a book <laughs> which is his anthology of guzzles has the subtitle real, real guzzles, guzzles in English <laughs> <laughs> as though everything before it like, wasn't quite real enough <laughs> Yeah. But he is kind of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's a kind of like, he doesn't feel like, again, another way he seems to challenge the way we might think now is like, he doesn't feel that like these Westerners are appropriating this form. So long as they might do it well, yeah, he's really pleased, really happy. Yeah. So it, it's kind of like, he's almost saying that, it's almost like to, to write the technically virtuosic guzzle and to be able to do that is to achieve this sort of position of justice in terms of the cultural yeah. relation like, and, and then one is being written and one is being read and one is being experienced like yeah. that so um so it's not like he's foreclosing it right away right, people yeah. don't get it it's like they could get it and they could really do it and he yeah. wants them to be able to do it but they've got to do it right. sure yeah. if you have a chance it's a fantastic anthology and just if you look at examples of the guzzle from the last even 10 years you'll find Patricia Smith has one called Hip Hop Guzzle, which um, is about just like dancing with your like girlfriends. Um, Terence Hayes has a great one called Guzzlehead. Um, Evie Shockley, a poet we just mentioned earlier, has a has a guzzle that's about um, gun violence in America. So I think it has, in a way, 
I mean, even the real guzzle, <laughs> like even limiting it to a certain kind of form, it, it really has yeah. opened up American poetry yeah. in a huge way. Yeah. And the Paul Paul Dune, I just remember, Paul Muldoon has one called The Little Black Book, which is just about all the people he slept with, <laughs> yeah. or he pretends to slept with. Um, I get, I, it's like a sign that this this poem has many different, mm -hmm. I don't know, facets and possibilities. It does, and I, I mean, you were reading uh, this uh, poem together by uh, um, Jericho Brown, the yeah. duplex, yeah, yeah. where he experiments with the form, where he sort of breaks the form, but only after like he understands what's the form, do what the form does. He has that like sort of he takes that position where he can break the form, yeah, and align it with like a certain vision. And uh, I feel that it's you mentioned like it's been a presence in the um, in the in the contemporary poetry scene, and I feel like it's it's, it's present like this. And I think it was you who introduced me to that poem by I think Tracy K. Smith, where each line like comes. Together. Yeah, yeah, it's Tracy K. Smith. There's been a lot here at that. Harvard. Yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot like that. I guess it's a, it's a happens to every form is there's a consolidation around a kind of a real kind or a paradigmatic kind, and then you you have fun with it and experiment with yeah. it. Yeah, so yeah. Tracy K. Smith has had very interesting poems mm -hmm. where exact lines come back in certain yeah. orders. Um, I guess instead of having a, a small refrain, the entire line is the mm -hmm. refrain. Very cool stuff. So. Um, any more questions? Next. Yeah, I think it's almost sign eight. Yeah, yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, we'll have a round of applause yeah. for Mark. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing I would say is that I, I think it, it's just it's how oh, you do. Let's do a question. Oh. <laughs> uh, sorry. Oh. Using the language to witness both beauty and violence within mm -hmm. the subject matter that you were talking about. And I'm wondering, in your own practice of writing poetry, in terms of, I think, Ailey Mellon has a quote where she says that attention is a form of love, and mm -hmm. in the sense that what you give time to, what you pay attention to, is a form of care and love. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering, in your own practice of writing poetry, I know Lee is so prolific and has written so many different forms and for so long in his life. and as you said, the magpie theory, perhaps this is always witnessing, and that's also maybe how he has such great volume of mm. work. Um, is is there a way? I'm just curious for you personally, as you write, that you kind of inhabit that own magpie who's witnessing and <laughs> you spill that into your work, or do you find yourself going through phases of maybe solitude and retreat, and then opening up into receiving <laughs> the world and all its multitude? That's really interesting. The Le Bon quote is really interesting, actually, especially because we have so much to talk now about the attention economy and mm -hmm. you know, like how much attention do any of us really have to give and how it's sort of become corporatized and, mm -hmm. and stuff like yeah. that. Um, I I mean, I to answer your question before you, yeah, yeah, I, I find um, the way Ali starts to write a poem with a phrase, and he talks in an interview. Um, I forget it's his Massachusetts review or something about the demands of a phrase, like the opening phrase. That I feel is exactly how I would write a poem, but the poem I write would not be as good, but it would follow the same trajectory where the sort of, mm. um, you know, the phrase and just mm. not being able to get that phrase out of your head. And then, and I guess that must have been kind of what happened to him with a snowman there. But, mm. but, yeah, it's, yeah. but, but his gift was to take that and to then create a poem which was the serious poem, yeah. you know, about something really meaningful and substantial. and. You know, mm -hmm. to sort of raise that kind of almost ludic magpie approach to to something that yeah, the real poems are being written. Mm -hmm. with that. It's funny you mentioned Ada Limon because she was one of Ali's students, um, and she writes a little bit about him in this edited volume on his work. Um, I mean, I wonder if even her sense that attention is love, and attention, maybe even a political attention to a, a crisis that's not being talked about, is a form of love. I wonder if that came from him at some point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, I have a poem whose title is um something I saw on a napkin at Clover. Um <laughs> and I think me I mean and maybe there's something Ollie-ish about that, but I think I made it the title because I hated it so much and I wanted to make fun of it, <laughs> which I don't think is something Ollie would necessarily well, Yeah, do. that's the he thing. It's like yeah. he'll tell you something and it's not either to reproduce it or to critique yeah. it. Yeah. That's mm. really interesting. Like how do you I'm not sure I could recover that sort of sensibility. In my yeah, I, if he could find the beauty in Clover, I <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
Anything uh, to add? No, it's just like I, I feel like with Ali, like and like the different like poems that I think we talked about and read, and and especially like a poem like Dhaka Gosses, which really interested me was. And the thing that interested me about that poem was that, yes, there's beauty and there's also the act of witnessing uh, the effects and like what happened during colonialism and like all of that, but the violence and everything. But once you start reading the poem and its drafts, the 10 drafts, he worked on that poem for more than a year, I think. And there are like 10, 15 drafts. And each time he, re he revises the poem, it, it just deepens, it becomes more compact. It's mm. like, it's so tight. And like the, the effect that it, it has compared to the first draft is different and like the opening line changes it becomes the last line um and he used to do that i think as a teacher at umass amherst he would um you know take a poem and like yeah. cross out like most of the lines and like keep the last four lines and be like that's your poem all of that's like you didn't you don't need that yeah i think so time is like a, a, a big like sort of thing that is there in his work and, and a lot of other poets where it's uh with attention to like language and uh yeah um, sort of um, finessing it like over the views of time yeah i mean that's it. kind of you know when, when jericho was reading here and i thought one of the great messages he gave <laughs> the students was editing and uh, not only editing but the idea that that is the process of creation yeah. so, to keep doing it over and over again and, you know all these drafts are incredible <laughs> to, to look at i was looking at the drafts of um I forgot the name of the poem, uh, um, the floating post office. Mm. And it's really interesting to see how he did it. Yeah. And the first stanza wasn't even there to begin with, and it comes in, and then yeah. he's changing the colors so it goes from green to jade, uh, and he's yeah. moving things around. Uh, it's fascinating. And, and that is a sestina as well. So there's all of that stuff going on. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was just right. going to say that um, I just have to say this, even though it sounds kind of uh, uh, snidey about other books and other kinds of poetry criticism. Yeah. Uh, but just that Bannon's book is just so readable. But I really honestly do think anyone who is interested in 20th century poetry, 21st century poetry, would really enjoy this book. And I can't say that about every book of literary criticism. So, I just, <laughs> like, so much that means a lot. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, round of applause for you, I think. Can you give another round of applause for all the speakers yeah. tonight? Yeah. We have some books for sale. Everyone can please. Thank you. I'm sorry, I should have introduced you. I was just kind of. I just realized. Oh, well, we're on the somewhere. I suspect you'll be doing some signing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. It's just not much space. I'm a bit conscious of being in your way. Can I ask you to say?